Hey, I'm David. And I'm Michael. And you're listening to The Element Podcast. (laughs) Well, as you guys probably know, we are not David or Michael. Those names get thrown around a lot around the element uh, headquarters here because <laughs> worldwide some people can't keep things straight. But one thing that is straight is that our boy Michael just showed up today. I mean, other thing facts. That's straight as me too. I mean, <laughs> <That's right. laughs> uh, Michael is here as an intern. We'll have him on at some point in time, possibly. Um, Maybe. Excited to film stuff for the fall. Fall is getting rolling, man. It like is. hunting season is about here. Like somewhere in the continental U.S., people can hunt stuff. Like in August. Yeah. It's Alaska. Nevada. Believe. Nevada. Maybe even Vada. Tennessee. Sometime. Who knows, right? But yeah. like, dude, it's like <clears throat> finally over. Like, the <laughs> doldrums of summer are coming to a close. For those who would attempt some western hunting, especially. Yeah. For those who might be uh, just kind of whitetail guy, it's still doldrum. There's at least whitetail things to do. Yeah, and that's, that's true. that's exciting. Yeah, that is true. You know, like, there's, there's, there's things out there to be done for whitetails besides, like, just... Sit around. <laughs> they got stuff on their heads. <laughs> they you know do. what I mean? Finally. They do, man. They look like bucks. And, uh, you know, you don't want to be that guy who is uh, trying to scramble around once, like, it is time to hunt, trying to get your stuff together. You need to make sure you got all your gear in line. That's a great thing to do this time of year. So um, this is this kind of sells itself, right? Like, you need good gear, and you need it That's when it's not expensive. And right now is the first light season opener sale. And straight up, if you want to get some pretty decent camo at like 40% off, it's the way to do it. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, you're going to be paying full price later on and be crying. So uh, go out there and get you some pretty decent stuff at a decent price. Yeah, we got the link in the description. Uh, so just if you scroll down, you can click on that. And while you're listening to this podcast, you can also be perusing the First Light Ooh. website for the discounts and deals that they've got on some of the stuff mm-hmm. that they uh, – They've got for sale. All so. the catalyst catalyst stuff is on sale. Like some good whitetail type stuff. Mm-hmm. Their whitetail pattern is a specter pattern, uh, and it, but it looks pretty good doing about near anything. I'll wear it a lot this year. Yeah, you're going to be dressed in specter. Yeah, uh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, I will have gadgets as well. Good. <laughs> 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 we'll get you gadgets. Well, we get actually you ordered some first light stuff this week, and and we were having to. Uh, you know, determine what pattern it would be in, and commonly we would say, "What pattern you want that in?" And we would say, "Inspector." Inspector. And Tyler and I would laugh every time. <laughs> <laughs> so it works pretty good. That link is in the description below. Hit that thing. Go get you some first light. So today we are doing some of the talk about that prep work. Right? Doing some of that talk. Doing that talk, That's man. Walking that walk and doing that talk. Do That's what you what do, do, man. Do what it do. Um, we're actually going to talk about some trail camera stuff, specifically some tr- some cell camera stuff. Later on in the podcast, we're going to have Mark Olis on, who's with Moultrie Mobile, and he like he gets the camera thing from a um, how would you say this? a manufacturer standpoint, right? Like he works for Moultrie, but he runs them like Moultrie Mobile. Even though like that name seems like a big company, like. They kind of are like mom and pop when it comes to the way they do this stuff. Yeah, like Mark will be taking sales calls and yeah. like troubleshooting and stuff, you yeah. know. And that's the thing. That's one of the things that I do like and appreciate about them is like their their uh, customer service is top notch. So, so within that, like Mark knows about near everything about these cameras, knows more than we do. So he's going to talk some about like using cell cameras specifically not like how to kill a deer with them but inadvertently yes like how to use a cell camera and this applies to all cell cameras not just moultries but we use moultries and we like them a whole lot and so we're going to talk about that but it works for all cameras right like there's certain settings and different things but mark will tell us all about that but before that we're actually going to talk more about the hunting stuff because we're trying to kill deer 
Mm-hmm. And a lot of us right now are what? <laughs> you know, they can like the bird. Kill deer. We call them kill deer. We're trying to kill deer. I don't, how do you reckon it came to be? I don't that know. We I thought the same thing. Deeds. The first time I ever saw it written, I was like, hold up. That ain't, that ain't right, is it? No, like, I don't kill understand deer. it. Yeah. But, somebody added an R on accident. Yeah. And now I'm in this like conundrum of yeah. do I call it a kill deer and be right or a kill D no. and be local? I mean, you don't say everything right anyway. So, I don't. I mean, might as well just call it a it, kill deer. I have to be a chameleon dude that's the deal if i'm yeah. around people like who are birders i yeah. call it a kill d well i'm gonna get the stank eye yeah i mean it's like you know i call this always called them sick of deer growing up some people now like to call them sika because you know it's been popular yeah because steve said it yeah but it's a sika um or Sika is how when I did game capture stuff. Yeah, uh, Sika deer is yeah. what we said. Sika, like a Sika. I never called Sika. No, Mm-mm. not until some guy from Michigan decided that's how they said it. <laughs> <laughs> some guy. That's right. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's but, right. Yeah, man. There's different things. Michigan that are people make things difficult, Acres, don't they? Dead gummit. You know, like <laughs> everybody knows what an acorn is. I'm sorry if you say acorn. Um, <laughs> But did you know that pecan is technically the actual right way to say the word pecan, uh-huh. not pecan? You know how you know that? Because Georgia people say it pecan. Uh, mm-hmm. The Indian word that it comes from has the sound pecan in it. Oh. So, and that's how it was pronounced, <clears throat> pecan. So that's why uh, we actually know the answer to that. So take that, you proper people, with yeah. your pinkies out. These people were in America for any of y'all. That's right. That's right. Were you a colonialist or something? Come on. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we are going to probably not hang any show cameras on any, any pecan trees because uh, there ain't none where I hunt. But we are going to talk quite a bit about how to hang trail cameras this time of year and kind of that early season type stuff, trying to kill deer, right? We'll talk about the settings and stuff later. Mark's going to help us with that. But we're trying to get after bucks specifically. And, and who knows? Maybe you actually are trying to get after does early season and kind of get those doe quotas filled or get some Dotus. some meat, some dough <laughs> some dough is ready. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, maybe you're running low on meat and it's time to make sure a deer hits the ground, and uh, that's fine too. But, Tyler, what is the first thing – like? It's trail camera season right now, right? Yeah. T-C-S-Z-N. Baby. That's right. <laughs> not um, Thompson Center. Y'all no, know, sir. Not sponsored. Nah, uh-uh. <laughs> but <laughs> which, it's funny we're talking about that. But um, like this time of year is is what we have learned. Like mid-August is probably about as early as it really benefits, especially for a public land hunter, mm-hmm. to get out and put out trail cameras. You know, private land, it's a little different if you can manage and keep deer on your property, this and that. But, like, still, like, bucks move around and stuff, right? So, yeah. say it's <clears throat> mid-August, and you're wanting to put out a trail camera. What's the first thing that you think about, like, as far as the location for that or where you want to hang a camera? Man, there's, a, there's some different directions I could personally go real quick. But, mm-hmm. um, but I would say, for me, and this may not be great – a great answer that you Mm -hmm. wanted. But the first thing I think about in our neck of the woods. Sure. Because it's different. Yeah. But uh, let's go into the different stuff. This is the first thing I think about because I'm used to being around here this time of year. Uh Right. Um, Is um, like thickets. And when I say that, usually that's like uh, an area that has shade, but also has honeysuckle or sumac or something like that. In the Thicket area. and brush are two things that like is more of a southern type thing to talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, like uh, those things kind of go hand in hand. But yeah, like, mm-hmm. and what do you mean by a thicket? Why are you why are you thinking about that for trail cameras? Uh, I'm thinking about bedding mm-hmm. uh, because <clears throat> I don't feel like it, at least in our neck of the woods, like I said, that uh, deer are moving too far from bedding in mm-hmm. most days. Um, and so I think that if you want to, um, you know, locate, there's a couple things you can locate, and that'll be either you know pigs, uh, bucks, or does in most cases <laughs> in those thick areas. Mm-hmm. And those are potential big game targets, I guess. Uh, which pigs aren't considered game here anyway. So, uh, but if you find bucks. Um, I don't think you're just, I don't think you should get too hype about it. Mm-hmm. Um, if you find those, um, I think you find those what? <laughs> if you find those deers <laughs> with no antlers on their heads, uh, <clears throat> 
if you find that if you find that you're in doe bedding area, a doe bedding area, and there's no bucks around, don't be discouraged because mm-hmm. I think that what you can end up with is a bedding area that um, will stay pretty consistent even into November and could potentially produce a good place to hunt a buck, especially if you, you know you got the right winds in that area or you got a foolproof entry or whatever. Mm-hmm. So, so that's the around here. Yeah. Now, what when you say when you say that you're implying that you could think about not around here too. Yeah. So I do a how lot, does that actually. change? <laughs> yeah, anywhere but here, right? Pretty popular uh, song. Anywhere but here. Oh. I want to go hunt deer. <laughs> uh, so uh, when you are thinking about that, what changes whenever you're thinking about going elsewhere? Yeah. So a lot of the country. Um, man, this is another another question. It depends on where you're going, but. Mm-hmm. Um, if there's ag, man, that's what I'm, that is what I'm typically thinking is like, find a place that deer will destine in the evenings, <laughs> destinate <laughs> in the evenings and, uh, and start a camera there. Would you hang, would you do that on beans, even though the beans are going to run out? Yeah, I think yeah, I would. This time of year. I think I would. I don't know I don't know a ton about this. We don't live in Beans country, but I've I've hunted it the last several years or a few years and uh in Bean country and from what I pick up is this is hard info to come by because it typically you know what? Farmers don't give us much information about how things work. They are the guys who are just like it just does it cuz it does. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to get too political here. <laughs> <laughs> do they good. do that because they don't really need to? You know what I mean? Like if they it don't works, need to let if you it know. works, that's great. They make money. If it doesn't, they still make money. I don't know. That's a good question. You know what I mean? I think that there could be some of that, but so as to not offend every farmer. I don't like every guy's that way. <laughs> yeah, I don't either. Uh, but I think that a lot of farmers, especially the older guys, just have plowed the same row. Yeah. For forty spray years, the same spray, do and... the same stuff, <laughs> and they don't have to like be too like um cutting edge mm-hmm. like there's just a way to grow beans and right. there's a way to grow corn way to grow milo right and it's just what you do yeah you get what so you get. like you, they, i think that that is a big thing a lot of times it's like well i've never actually had to describe this to someone yeah you're probably and right i ain't worried about you stupid whitetail hunter just get out of yeah, here you yeah know? <laughs> yeah well i feel like what you end up with is sometimes you get a deer hunter that also is a farmer and mm-hmm. then they still <clears throat> can't tell you a whole lot um but there's not great information about like the preference of beans throughout all the stages of its life during deer season, the Mm -hmm. beans life that is. Uh, But what I understand, and I've heard several people say this is like beans are a destination food source pretty much year round Um, from the time they start growing to the time they are laying dead on the ground for a month or whatever. Um, there's just, I guess, different things that are eaten in that process somewhat. Um, and then I think also there is like one, there is like one time that beans are not very, very good, I guess, from what I understand is when they're yellow. But at the same time, that whole field typically isn't yellow because there are low spots in the field that hold water and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And the, pl- the plant just does, doesn't die till later because it's such a healthy plant or whatever. So mm-hmm. it's like... Any particular field could produce deer forage all year. And so, but I think I would focus on beans. Um, I think corn is difficult, especially when we're talking about trail cameras, which is what we're doing today. I have um, a better grasp of beans than I do corn mm. as far as deer usage. Yeah, uh, me This too. stuff is also regional, you yeah. know, because like, I don't know, if you're in a pretty lush part of the country, the deer might only use the corn in the fall. Mm-hmm. If you're in a spot where it's pivot corn... That's the only food around, and they're going to figure out a way to eat a corn stalk if they have to. Right. You know, right. so it's like very, it's very yeah, it's tough. True. It's true. Yeah. I think what you can, what thing you can rely on, whether it's corn or beans, is that if you find entry trails into that field, mm-hmm. say if you're hunting public or you have a, like, you have access to the woods right there and mm-hmm. you can see the trails. I think that's the that's the kicker. Is like find the best trail coming into that thing, which is usually in the back, most remote corner or whatever. If you got ten foot corn, it, it doesn't matter as much for that time of year. It will whenever they, they cut it and it's the rut or whatever. But anyway, that's that's where you would I think focus. And the, and so in the end, like it probably doesn't matter a whole lot corn or beans as long as there is a food source there. 
that is tended to well and mm-hmm. and has and produces food for them. I'll I guess. go ahead and say um, I like to do the least common denominator system on this stuff, and this doesn't always work. But I'm a big fan of alfalfa because, mm-hmm. in my opinion, it's the easiest to figure out because it's always good. And there's not a lot of math to it. It's good mm-hmm. until it's dead when it dies like really cold. So mm-hmm. as long as it's got enough water to grow, it's probably my the easiest for me to hunt because yeah. I know it works. Right? I feel like, and I feel like that out of if you were to take and plant and uh, plant some corn and some beans and some alfalfa together, I do actually feel like the beans would be the most preferential. Probably, I, I do feel like that, but. Obviously, all there's so many variables. Like uh-huh. it, it all that matches up with like where a creek bottom sits and where a thick spot is mm-hmm. and where the does are going to be because the bucks got to go somewhere else and until the rut and all these different mm-hmm. things. And so, like you know, the only thing we can do here is kind of give out some scenarios and say yeah. this is kind of what we're looking for. But the the goal is to talk about how to hang a camera over the food source to be able to kill a deer there yeah. then or later. And we're and at this point, like we're in August, we're trying to find mm-hmm. deer. You yeah. know what I mean? So we did this on Texas Public a few years uh-huh. back. Um you can get a couple different places we've done this. A picture at two AM of a big buck, most of the time I will tell you is useless. You mm-hmm. know, like and I'm not gonna be rude or anything to people, but like Except on a podcast, right? Because y'all y'all used to it. But no, you get what I'm saying. Like a buddy at church comes up and shows me a picture of some big deer on his property, and it's like 3 a.m. And in my mind, I'm like, man, that's great. Yeah. But it, probably you're never only going to see that deer like there's like two days a year, and it's probably November 14th and 15th that you're going to be able to see that. Um, that's regional, by the way, guys. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. like, um, you know, it's it's not hype yeah. unless you're backtracking this deer. And you have the ability to do that, then it's super hot, right? <clears throat> yep. Because just the knowing he's there is a huge thing. So, mm-hmm. like, why not hang your camera at the place where the most deer cross? Right, right? the most deer go to the ag. That's where you want. That's where you want your camera. Yeah. Then you can figure more stuff out from there. And this time of year is a great time to do that because you have time to figure things out. Yeah, I mean, you still got time. Like, if mm-hmm. you're an October one opener or so, like everybody or a lot of people are. Um, you have still, you know, if we're talking about getting cameras out in early to mid August, you've got a month and a half, you know, Mm -hmm. um, before you got to really, you know, get, get, have your plan right pretty much. But the bucks are what they are now. Like they've, they have most their antler. Yeah. Yeah. You will, you will most likely know a shooter at this Mm -hmm. point. And so that's good. And, and you have six weeks to find where this buck is betting if you want that. Mm -hmm. And here's the thing is you do want that. But you may not want to find his bedding until um, mid September. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Because it can change. It, it's it, there's it's likely to change. I mm-hmm. think in a lot of cases, and I think that depending on where you are, parts of the country, most of the parts of the country, whenever they kind of are coming out of velvet, that's kind of when they change that to that fall range. Mm-hmm. And when I mean, we've seen it here in this this where we hunt around here is like. Just as difficult as it gets, it's as not normal as it gets. It's like deer, deer here are just not like the rest of the deer. Like you hear about people in the Midwest and the upper Midwest and how deer react and stuff and, you know, how they interact with their habitats and their seasons and people and everything. And these deer are different. And still we do see a fall like relocation, or mm-hmm. we have at least. I mean, we were all over the bucks in the summer of 2017. <laughs> like, yes. We had only daylight pictures of these deer coming back to bed right there next to the camera. And basically the last three weeks of September, they seemed to disappear and we still gave them a shot on opening day, which is like October one or two. It was a cold front, massive cold front, like yeah. never this cold on October. Like high two. of like 60. Yeah. Which was, that's yeah. good for us. Casey and I hunted all day, had a great win, great access to this place and did not see a deer, right? Deer was gone. We didn't see a doe or anything. We saw in this pigs area. one time. We saw I pigs think, in the morning, which is not not a good thing. That was when you're trying that to kill was, deer. That was actually when I decided for sure that I didn't want to hunt all day anymore, <laughs> and I still have a few times. Like I've done it at least once a year, probably since then. Well, the, one of the dumbest things you can do is let your buddy talk you into hunting a all day sit in Texas for the opener. It's probably real, <laughs> real bad. Hey, I'm a dumb guy yeah, sometimes, man. man. Yeah, well, you're hanging out with a dumb guy, too, and that's how it goes. <laughs> Is it like dumb squared around <laughs> Is here? Is dumb and dumber? Uh, so, 
<laughs> uh, okay, that's on a food source. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, how are you going to kill that deer? What's that process look like? Um, man, so, there's, don't, there's... don't tell me draw your bow. I want you to. Yeah. Be, you know, yeah. <laughs> uh, you got to shoot him in the right spot. That's right. Uh, so. There are different ways to kill what you're finding on a food source. Mm -hmm. And I think that what you'll see is like when they transition, say you pick them up here in before the velvet sheds, um, and then he transitions and disappears. I think that you can find where the does are most heavily coming into that food source in, uh, throughout the fall. And like, even after, you know, it, it, depending on when crops come out, say they come out or whatever, even after that, like figure out where these does are most heavily, uh, using that field or that food source and try to hunt there during the prime rut, mm-hmm. because that deer is, I think, potentially likely to revisit that area, uh, during the rut, mm-hmm. you know, he's, he knows, like, that, he knows area. that area. It's home. That's right. Yeah. Like he spends time there. Yes. It might not be fall core range but he he'll he spends, end up back there. and quite honestly dude like these core ranges home range all that stuff those are terms that the i would almost say and i might get chastised for this but i almost say that the hunting industry has come up with this stuff a little bit now there is some data out there to back it up mm-hmm. but it's regional too depending yeah, on where it's you're also at individualistic yeah absolutely it is but like say you're remember we we're flying into chicago the other day and in in like northern Illinois, it is flat as a pancake, and there's just a few trees here and there. Mm-hmm. Like those deer, like they have to live in the cover. Mm-hmm. They can't go too many awful many places, yeah. you know. Yeah. Like so, like it ain't just out west where like you have a different look, you know. Mm-hmm. Like there's some places out east where it's still like deer don't always have to move. Yeah, you know, you might have the same buck doing the same. Living in the same forty acres yeah. all year long, so yeah. don't think it's like a thing that has to. No, happen. that's a, actually a really good point and something that I was thinking about earlier. I'm yeah. glad, glad you made it, and that's so that's something you know to also consider. So if if the buck does not relocate, mm-hmm. or if you find this deer in mid September and you you find his quote unquote core range here, like mm-hmm. he's 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 you know close by in daylight, um, <clears throat> then. Or, or close to daylight, I guess he's say he's at last light at the field edge. A way to go find him and kill him is to basically take hop on a map. If you know that area pretty well, you can do this from a map. You mm-hmm. might have to, you know, you might have to get if you have to get boots in there, then you can definitely mess things up. But if you've had boots in there and you know how to correlate different types of habitat, we talked about this actually in our little uh, clinic or whatever it was at Cabela's a few weeks back. Uh, we had a question about this, and if you've if you have spent time in there during different times of the season, different times of the off season, the post season, that kind of thing, and you now can take a map and go, okay, when it looks like that, that's thick. When it looks like that, those are actually oak trees, and mm-hmm. there's nothing underneath them, right? So you know those things. That is super helpful this time of year because you don't have to get in there and mess things up. Yeah, and I actually on Onyx right now, you can get on there, and they have, I think, like four, three or four different tree layers. You can do mm-hmm. deciduous versus coniferous, which pretty much means evergreens and then trees that lose, lose their leaves. You can do red oaks versus white oaks. You can do, like, young aspens. Mm-hmm. There's all kinds of different layers you can turn on on that thing to kind of help you navigate, like, hardwood timber versus bottomlands and all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, if you put all the if you put all the if you put the pines or evergreens or whatever and the uh all the oak layers on and they're not showing up in that thick little spot then you know that's like a lower young story Mm -hmm. understory of brush basically so Mm -hmm. uh anyway basically that's what you want to do is see like where where is this buck potentially coming from he's going to be in some thicker stuff Mm -hmm. and he's going to be in a remote place where people don't go and it might be it might, might actually be fairly close to somebody's house. It might be the backyard of an old lady's house, kind of. You know, like, it might be a 100 yards off her back porch. But, it, you know, if she doesn't go there, then that's a potential. So uh, finding those spots, those potential spots where you might be, and, and basically following trails from the field edge where you're picking him up mm-hmm. back to those areas. And if you can stay on a trail that goes into that and drop that camera a little bit further back, say two, three, four hundred yards back, you you get that deer in daylight, and that's that's how you kill them on opening day. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's 
that's how you do it. That's dude, talk about getting me pumped. <sighs> and the way to do that too is to go in <clears throat> and hang and hunt and do yes. that. And like Yeah, you don't want to go in there and set a you no. set a trail camera and get out of there quick. You don't want to yeah. go in there and set a tree stand or something like that or you know, you don't want to hang sticks in there while you're mm-hmm. messing around. I wouldn't do none of that stuff. I'd go in no. there and this is when you can kill one in the morning too, because you don't go in there and maybe run the risk of bumping up a deer or whatever. You mm-hmm. know, who knows? Maybe he, your trail camera will tell you, mm-hmm. but there's a chance he's hanging out at the food stores and at like a bedding staging area before he gets back to this spot. Mm-hmm. You get in there real early, go in, bring your saddle stuff with you. We're going to use a cruiser saddle because they're super comfortable. You can sit your all day long sit that Tyler's Man, talking about. If you, if, <laughs> if you didn't get the fact that we were dumb. <laughs> It's because we weren't hunting in a saddle. Then. That's right. That's man. right. We were, I mean, we actually were hunting some really hard tree stands. Yeah, so hard was, to hang. Too. My body was hurting. Yeah, that's the other nice thing about this. Oh, is we like, were kind of loud that morning too, if I remember correctly. Probably. Uh, that's that's another thing. The com- This is a reason why, and I'm not saying I won't hunt out of a tree stand ever again. But this is a reason why the hanging hunt out of a saddle is so awesome. Is you've got a platform that you can manage with one hand. Even if you're just a young intern that's very skinny, <laughs> like you can manage this, you know what I mean? And uh, you don't, you're you not making a bunch of noise and stuff. There's yeah. less moving parts. And it's a good thing. There's uh, cloth stuff. Yeah. Now, you can still get some clanks and clangs, but mm-hmm. still, like, when most of your system is cloth, it's way quieter, mm-hmm. and it makes a big difference. And uh, I think that there's it's just not a better hanging hunt tool. Now, yeah. if it's cold and you are hunting, like, a annual – or a perennial tree stand or whatever. Like, mm-hmm. yeah, tree stands are real nice. Ladder yeah. stands are even nice in that situation. Mm-hmm. But to be mobile and to make moves on deer, it's hard to beat a cruiser saddle for mm-hmm. sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, now, let's take this a different direction. We've backtracked this deer uh, from a destination agriculture food source. Let's go hunt some different deer. Okay. Um, <clears throat> a lot of the country uh, in the pre-season and early season experiences acorn fall mm-hmm. or acorn fall depending on where you're you were <laughs> at you might even say it different i can't even pronounce another way to say it but um that's a little bit different of a hunt i feel like uh and it's not as much of a backtrack them to it as it is to find the hot spot <clears throat> mm-hmm. how do you find that hot spot and then how do you hang a camera accordingly to get you some information you're talking about hunting over acorns, right? Pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I would. Uh, the first thing that I'm doing is I'm I'm not looking for an acorn tree that's dropping on the field edge. Mm. It looks beautiful. Mm-hmm. It looks awesome. Mm-hmm. Like we were walking down in Illinois with Isaac, walking down this field edge, and I was looked up and I was like, man, there's gonna be acorns falling from that tree pretty heavy, and you could kill a deer there for sure. But I think that the what I'm looking for is you know, like you said, you can turn on this on the map uh, on on X, or you can just go in there <clears throat> and find stuff. You can also look for tree crowns from fields and stuff like that back in there, and say and pull your binos up and identify that this that is a white oak tree back in there. That's when you really say big. looking for tree crowns, you mean like on the aerial looking for a big tree from? The, is that what you mean? No, by that? but you can do that. Yeah, uh, that's a good point. I was thinking more like. Um, you're, you pull down the road, you get a look back at some timber across the field. Oh, yeah. You want right. to get some perspective. You don't want to be right up on the edge of the timber, right? Mm-hmm. You want to be looking at it from distance. Pull your binos up, look at the leaves, and, and go, yeah, those are, I think those are white oaks. I'm going to mm-hmm. go in there and look. You want to be back in the timber, I think. You want to be, potentially, if you're in ridge country, I think you want to be, you know, uh, on the end of ridges or, um, you know, up you know, somewhere on top of a ridge, potentially in a saddle, Mm -hmm. you can, you you know, this is something we talk about a lot, but pairing, uh, multiple attributes that are advantageous for you in an area is the best way to, to kill deer. Mm -hmm. You can't just take and go, I want to hunt acorns because they're going to eat acorns Mm -hmm. and just think that you can't feel confident. I don't feel like if you just go in there and hunt a tree, you got to have multiple reasons why this works. So that's what I, I would look for is stuff back in the timber a little ways, uh, it's going to get darker earlier back in there, but mm-hmm. the deer are going to feel more comfortable. And I think if you get uh, some sort of a little, even if it's a small cold front, uh, especially if you brought some wind and it knocks some of those acorns off the tree, I think you have a very good chance of killing deer. Now, I think you're going to want to hunt, like a lot of people have white oaks. I think you're going to want to hunt white oaks earlier in the season 
So as far as hanging the trail camera, uh, going in and finding those, KC is really good. I am better now than ever, but he's always been really good at bringing his binos every time he's in the woods pretty much. And so he's always able to look up at a tree and go, there's a bunch of acres on that one right there, you know? So let's hang a camera right in here underneath this thing. And uh, if it's, this is, man, there's so many advantages to running a cell camera, but this is one of them where like, that tree could all of a sudden just knock down a bunch of acorns in about three days and it's just hammer time and you how don't many know times it. years back do we miss that because oh, we weren't oh, running dude so we have camps. what are called schumard trees in mm-hmm. or eight or schumard oaks in our area they're red oaks but they have a big acorn that's like almost the size of a white oak and there was one year where we missed it and we were like we've been We've been waiting ever since for that year to happen again and for us to to do something about it. But, like, Mm -hmm. it was hammered underneath where they had all fallen, and they fall kind of early. So and they fall before deer season a lot of times. Yeah. And so, like, that's that's an issue, too, where, you know, if you – if you're not in the woods, you don't know they're falling. Mm-hmm. And so, and this a, also works for persimmons too. You yeah, know, it's not yeah. just oak trees, but um, anything that's a mast that the deer are targeting, it's a thing to do. And, and those are kind of the two main ones that are going to be fall specific that you can think about. Now, this situation, I'm always thinking about an evening hunt mm-hmm. uh, because a lot of times it's open hardwoods kind of in the places where these are. So the deer aren't like, as long as your access is good, you're not intruding too much into bedding and messing things up. Mm-hmm. You're waiting on the deer to move to you to come mm-hmm. eat the acorns, right? And yeah. and um, depending on what part of the country you're in, like you were saying a while ago, it gets pretty hot and heavy because it's all of a sudden like, oh my goodness, look at this ample amount of food. You know, it's it's hog time. You know, yeah. and because deer, specifically bucks, they they are not stupid. Uh, God has made them to where like it's time to chow down before the rut. They mm-hmm. get to be in really, really good shape, and they put on yeah. the feedback. Acre, like bears acres do. are rich in fat. You yes, know? yes, so. absolutely. Yeah. So it's, it's like it is a good thing for them to eat, and they will hit it. Mm-hmm. And so that's what I'm always thinking about is trying to do um, a hanging hunt or even a pre-hung set where you are in that really good spot. Now, there's a lot of mm-hmm. guys who – I guess take the trail cam out of it a little bit here. I know we're talking about how to hang cameras in these situations to kill deer, but um, there's some guys who who don't do that, and I think that this is a thing where people are hunting large tracts of timber, like say some of the national forests and stuff you can hunt, where they take the approach of hunt the hot sign Mm -hmm. instead. I've never really done that too much. Have you ever done the hunt the hot sign thing? I mean, I know I have done it. I'm not saying I've done it successfully, though, and yeah. I can't think of a a time. If we're talking about, like, feeding type stuff. Now, as far as, like, rut sign, yeah, I, I can think of a few instances where I have hunted the hot sign. Uh, but I've always had, like, a very – like, when I look at maps, I mean, I, I want to pick the tree. Yeah, sure. And so – and uh, Yeah, I'm not a – I'm never – I shouldn't say never – Ideally, I know where I'm headed when I leave out, yeah. if I'm heading out with a saddle set up. Now, if I'm going to hunt on the ground and I'm stalking around, mm-hmm. that's one thing. But I hardly am ever like, I'm going to go hang in a tree and I don't know where. Because yeah. that's a good way to walk around for five miles and not end up in a tree. We've yeah. done that a few times. Oh, yeah. It's terrible. We're stupid. Yeah. Um, but like, I think a lot of guys, especially, uh, and this is stuff I'm learning from other hunters that I see and talk to and talk on the podcast and stuff, like uh, take some of our buddies from Midwest Whitetail. This is a thing that they do from time to time, especially on those urban hunts, right, where uh, they go in, find some white oaks that are dropping, and pair that with some fresh rubs that are there. They know a buck is using the area, probably eating those, and can just hop in a tree right there and hunt. Mm -hmm. Yeah. can be very effective, it would seem. Yeah. I haven't done it. We don't really live in an area that's conducive for that, and Mm -hmm. oftentimes that time of year I'm in a different place either i'm either hunting locally or i'm in a different part of the country where that's not really the thing you do Mm -hmm. because i'm saving those states for rut hunts right right i i you know one thing that comes to mind for me is um i mean i just i like i'm going to pick a very very like specific spot when i go in i may not even pick the tree but i will have like i will likely be in a spot that's 50 yards within a 50 yard like circle you know what i mean and so like i was thinking in 2020 at the end of the year i ended up 
going in with a specific spot in mind and ended up hunting actually closer. So I, I didn't actually hunt super – like I probably hunted like two-thirds of the way in from where I wanted to go actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I ended up killing um, – first time in and I killed off a hot, hot sign. And Mm -hmm. that was why, like I went in all the way, nearly all the way. And as I'm getting in there, the sign's getting a little less and I start looking at my map and I'm like, you know, there's not much sign right here. And if I keep going, it actually looks like it potentially could get worse for a few reasons. One being that there's just not a lot of habitat, you know, further back in there. Mm -hmm. And I might've just walked right through where all the deer were. And I actually did. And so (laughs) I was real slow, came back real quiet, set up real quiet, two thirds of the way in from where I was. And literally I'm filming what we call B roll, which is just like landscape shots. I want to set up, tell the story of where I'm at. I want people to know like, what where the area at. looks like. Yeah. Where, <laughs> yeah. Oh, they don't worry. They, they'll figure that out. Uh, no, I want people to, to, you know, have like, I don't want them to just see something and not have a perspective. And I want to film these wide shots so that people mm-hmm. can see what I'm hunting. I literally am filming the first shot of this, uh, Creek crossing that I had seen potentially on the map. And also when I got there, I did see it. And, like a shooter buck is in my frame whenever <laughs> I, was, I was recording and I was like, Oh, s- holy smokes, you know? And so from then it was just haywire. Like it was nuts. And I, it was because those deer were living right there. Mm-hmm. And I was just happened to be on the right side with the wind going in and happened to be very quiet, which it happened to be, I, I intentionally tried to do these things, mm-hmm. but sometimes, you know, it doesn't always work out that way. Yeah. So that was a particular instance where like, uh, I can say I did hunt the hot sign, but most of the time I am picking a tree that I want to hang in. And then when you get there and there's hot sign, that gives you a good feeling. You know what I mean? Because you got the map and the reasons you want, you said that was a good spot on the map. And that correlates with like, whoa, there's hot sign here. Mm-hmm. This is going to be awesome. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's it's working out. So Yeah, absolutely, dude. And that makes you excited. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now let's take it to a different direction. Okay. Again, for uh, preseason and then early season. I call early season pretty much everything until the rut starts. So um, about November, right? So that's still early. I know that like you could go into all 37 phases or whatever <laughs> they come up with, right? But yeah. um, so uh, leading into the rut is still what I call early season. It's probably wrong, but that's what I did. Uh, Some people so, call it pre-rut, so if that helps yeah. you think about it. Yeah, so um, the uh, the scrape thing is a little bit different and kind of stands alone. Uh, there is deer sign, and then above deer sign there is uh, scrapes, particularly perennial scrapes, in our opinion. Like, it does mm-hmm. not get much better. The only better deer sign that there can be is a actual buck standing there, right? Which you saw, like you talked about earlier, in your frame. Yeah. But um, <laughs> there's an approach that we use, and um, it's real particular, and we can't even always accomplish it because it's very dependent upon like the particular scrape but there's this like perennial scrape thing that we do where we go out early season or pre-season rather and try to find a scrape to hang a a camera over that's going to in turn help us kill deer over that scrape Mm -hmm. how does that really look and work um so i think you have to think about it with a lot of different like same thing. There's a lot of different variables variables involved. Um, the the best way to take and find these places on a map that I can think about is to find where like multiple um, avenues of travel intersect potentially. Mm-hmm. So, uh, say there's a fence line, a brushy fence line, or uh, an irrigation ditch. And if it ends up like leading into a creek system and they come together at like a 90 and they both go separate ways. Um, So think of it as like a cross or something like that, you know, just like four way meeting, right? Mm -hmm. An intersection at that intersection is a good place and say it's all ag on the, on the quadrants of this thing. You at that intersection is a good place to potentially find a, a big scrape that was there at one point it may be perennial uh or you know it may be used like throughout the summer and it may not it may mm-hmm. be uh but if it's a big scrape you can still find it there and know that like at some point you can kill there but 
I think the, that like finding things like that that come together, uh, you could find like so if you got um, a similar thing where you got like two field field corners that come up adjacent to each other, there may be big blocks of timber on both sides, but right there it's kind of creating a little pinch right there. Um, and you've got deer that can come from this big block of timber, like to the southeast and the big block to the northwest or whatever, mm-hmm. right in that area between those two pinches, uh, to field field corners. That's a great place on the inside of the woods there to find something like that. And then outside of like things like that, there's other ways, but, um, like just getting out in the woods is important yeah. to find those things. Absolutely. And that's, that was where I was going to do the follow up com- or like talk about this is yeah. like, there's you can't this is like one of those things it's kind of like predicting big buck move it and saying you're gonna go shoot a big deer you can do it a whole bunch but 95 percent of the time you're gonna be wrong and it's the same yeah. thing with this finding scrapes like this mm-hmm. you know like you just you got to cover ground to yeah. find it that's just the only way to do it because and, most of the time at those intersections you're not going to find a like year long year round used scrape mm-hmm. like you're just not going to in most situations i don't think yeah we, we've seen that at least it's real particular yeah it, like it just we, happens you know, truth be told, we haven't found one yet this th- this year. Mm-hmm. Uh, that seems to be that, yeah. and uh, that's okay because we can kill deer other ways too. Mm-hmm. But what we're trying to tell you is like it is the thing if oh. you can find it. Yes, like, and there's a particular scenario that works, mm-hmm. right? And uh, your 2020 Illinois buck is the scenario. Yeah, we summer scouted this place, found one of these scrapes hung a camera over it didn't weren't using cell cameras then i can't imagine you know using a multi oh, mobile over one of those things freaking being, out oh and that's the thing you have to be mature you have to be able yeah. to handle it yeah that's right <laughs> because if you're freaking out you're getting because we had deer on that thing all year long big yeah. giant bucks right yeah the one you shot wasn't even the biggest on the camera or that you saw that day yeah and he's still the biggest eight point i've ever seen in real life <laughs> okay so like um it's you have to have patience you have to have discipline and know the time to strike and the time yeah. to strike is a late october cold front yeah mm-hmm. i mean if we had i i don't remember because i i just don't I, it's not in my mind that i remember this for sure but i think that if we had hunted that location prior to or no if we'd hunt, hunted prior to when i killed mm-hmm. and from opening day I don't think there was a daylight of a mature buck in there. Uh, your buck was there one time with maybe five minutes left in shooting light. I don't think and so. as thick as it I was, think it was dark. Yeah. Well, that's what I'm saying. Like as yeah. thick as it was, it's probably too dark to shoot. I mean, it was it was in the night. Like yeah. it was he was completely glowing and checking the scrape. But yeah. he didn't show up till that week before. And like at all. And we had some bigger bucks on that camera all summer mm-hmm. that were there in daylight. And like from but from October one mm-hmm. till the day I killed, which was the twenty third, I don't think we had a a buck that was bigger than two and a half years old in the daylight on that camera. And what Tyler's saying is that you go in there because you're like it's October fifteenth cold front, it's going to be awesome. No, what's going to happen is you're going to come in ten minutes after shooting light, and you're going to bust those bucks getting yep. your set, you know, getting yourself down, mm-hmm. and you're going to mess up the whole thing because they are sensitive, yeah. right? You killed that deer on the twenty third of October, if mm-hmm. I remember right. Mm-hmm. It was a great cold front, great setup, first time in, went in and killed the deer. Given that evening, um, <laughs> through a lot of situations, uh, y'all got busted uh, in the tree. Mm-hmm. Um, because there was a snowman up there uh, <laughs> moving around in the tree uh, who wasn't Tyler. Uh, mm. And a big buck saw you, and then the buck that you saw, who's also a big buck you shot, um, you then went in and recovered that deer, but did it pretty quickly, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. But that was enough for those deer to pretty much not show back up on that camera yeah. Uh, yeah. the rest of the year. I Yeah, and and another point that I'm trying to make, too, is like, the, there were the, the deer that I almost shot that got busted was mm-hmm. a monster, mm-hmm. and uh, I had him at eight yards, and he I don't believe he was on the camera he was he was on the camera all summer in daylight most of the time, mm-hmm. like from like like from the point where you didn't know what he was going to be almost mm-hmm. to the point that he's like fully hard horned. And he's on daylight. And I think that once October 1 was there, maybe whenever it was in September, the last time he showed up, 
like if I'd have gone in there thinking, I'm going to go kill this deer. He's coming in in daylight in early September or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, or mid September. If I'd have gone there on October one, I could have really stunk that area up yeah. and messed the whole thing up. As opposed to waiting, like you said, to a long, like a late season or a late October cold front and seeing both that buck and the new buck that showed up the week before in the, in the dark. So, mm-hmm. you know, like even trying to get on an early season pattern on October 1, I, I just, it can, it can work. But I think that a cell camera can help you with that because you know up to the minute, like September 30th, that buck was in there in the day, in the daylight. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to go in on October 1st and kill him, right? Mm-hmm. But if you don't have, if you're not using a cell cam, then you either go in there to mess it up, pull the card on September 30th and potentially mess it up, or you just, you know, wait for a, a cold front, but you don't know that that buck stopped showing up after he shed velvet or he, you know, whatever it mm-hmm. is. There's something that changes right there around the first or middle of September. It causes a lot of deer, even deer that are homebodies, like the big one that I saw, to do something different. And, you know, like that buck may have relocated his his core range after he shed velvet but mm-hmm. we saw him hard horn in daylight we got video on the trail camera of him he's doing horn. like a lip curl yeah it's yeah. cool yeah and then and and then i saw him again that night like on the late in late october so mm-hmm. he was there but i just don't think he was there in daylight I from think mid-september or whatever on that has to do a lot i my hypothesis is that has to do with the testosterone level rising and it's like a natural impulse of theirs. Not that they are avoiding hunters, and I think deer can learn to do that too, but I think that um, they all get mad at each other. So there's this dispersion that happens of like kind of spreading out and not being yeah. homeboys we'll with each other. Yeah, 200 yards over there yeah. instead. Yeah. And then also there's like some level of like, even on big mature bucks, hey, I kind of need to just stay in this spot because if I go out there – you know, four year old over here might think he's big and bad and yeah. come stick me in the butt while I'm having my head down eating or whatever. Yeah. You know, like there's this whole like sudden raised level of danger from yeah. other bucks that that they experience. You know, different like, social mm-hmm. dynamic between the herd there. Yeah, I, I I think that's actually a really good point. I think that is definitely what is going on there. It's a bigger part of the October lull than, than yes. anything else. Yeah. yeah. No, I think you I think you're spot on there. Like that I didn't even thought about that, but that I would almost guarantee you that that is the thing. Like deer I've been able to hunt some pretty cool properties over the years and I've seen a lot of deer interactions and deer are like they are spooky of a big deer with pointy things on its head. Oh yeah. And it's you can <clears throat> I know people talk about them and they do exist from time to time. Some deer are just fighters and, and are that way, but a lot of times the biggest, most mature buck can still be pretty wary of yeah. another buck. He may fight two times a year you or think something. This we could go back to this the deer you were talking about in the creek, right? Uh mm-hmm. that in twenty twenty, mm-hmm. he was probably <clears throat> the most mature buck in the area. And then a two year old ran right at him because things got, they got weird. Yeah. Right. And like he freaked out. Yeah. Because he's like, I don't know what to do with this deer that's coming at me. Yeah. You know. And it's because yeah. it's just like they deer for sure on the fight or flight scale are all about the flight when they can be. Oh yeah. Like if they don't know what's going on, <clears throat> they're fl- they're flighting. Yes. <laughs> I mean, and that's what happened with the buck that I actually shot there in Illinois. Mm-hmm. Was <clears throat> the the big one got spooked, ran through the only gap in that thick area right there mm-hmm. and ended up like busting this deer and he he freaked out he didn't put his head down and try to knock antlers with this I deer i'm out he freaked out mm-hmm. and i don't think he was subordinate necessarily because from what i understand from the guy who's in the tree with me he told me that these deer were like mad at each other they're squaring off i couldn't yeah. see them he said they were mad and they were <clears throat> you know puffed up and whatever so i don't think that either one of them was necessarily scared of the other but mm-hmm in a minute where he doesn't know what's going on. Right. So, you know, one thing that, uh, as far as like hanging a camera there, this, like you said, the cell cam would have been ideal. We hung it sort of high. That's another thought Mm -hmm. about scrape cameras is potentially to hang it kind of high so that it stays out of the buck's view. But, um, you know, I I don't know. I think that like one, one thing you want to do with a scrape camera is you want to make, this was key for me is <clears throat> we ended up hanging it on the best tree we could find. It ended up being good because we could tell where the deer were coming from. Mm-hmm. And in that situation where we were at, it's thick in there, 
um, I needed to know what tree to hang into. So I was ready for a shot. And I mean, I was my, the buck that I sh- ended up shooting was at 20 yards ready to give me a shot whenever things hit the fan. Mm-hmm. Right. And so it was, it, I was set up right. But, um, that was because we had previous knowledge and I went in there and pulled the camp, the car too, mm-hmm. that, um, those deer were coming from a particular direction overall. It didn't happen every time, but if you can be like, yeah, 70, 80% of the time, these deer are coming down this trail to enter this scrape, then you can hunt, you can hunt well because mm-hmm. you're hunting potentially a wind that seems favorable to them, mm-hmm. but isn't because, you know, I mean, it's, they say it's a just off wind, you know, mm-hmm. just to say the cliche statement, but like it is. And that's where like taking a camera and pulling all the stuff together to make just the perfect hunt is just as cool as it gets. It man. is, man. So um, <clears throat> we actually have notes here about what we're going to talk about in this podcast, <laughs> and I didn't follow them at all. I'm sorry, Tyler, but it worked out pretty good. Uh, <laughs> here in a second, we're going to get Mark on to talk more about the settings type stuff to talk about with this deal. Mm-hmm. Uh, but I do want to talk about one other thing that you might want to hang a uh, camera over, and that's water, mm-hmm. because we actually have had some success with this. Mm-hmm. It's somewhat difficult. Because uh, water usually means that there's not as many things to strap a camera to because, um, you know, a lot of times along the water's edge, you either have like wispy little trees or you have water itself. So Mm -hmm. it's kind of hard to get the footage of the deer or the pictures of the deer um, taking a drink. Now, we had success doing this over a uh, what we call a pila, which is like a tank that sits at the base of a windmill. Mm -hmm. And that... Uh, is a lot easier to do because there's stuff around it. You know, you have 360 <clears throat> degrees around that to use as opposed to like a lake shore or something, whatever. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But that has, uh, you know, half of your area you can't hang a camera yeah. on, right? Yeah. So what is the um, the tactic behind hanging a camera over water? What are you trying to get there? Well, you're, <clears throat> I mean, simply put, you're trying to get a deer that is like thirsty, right? Mm-hmm. You're trying to get uh, them coming to satiate or satisfy their, uh, thirst. And so, um, you know, this is one thing, our, our buddy, Tony Peterson, um, is, he's kind of the man on this. He is, he's, he is the man when it comes to water. Uh, I think it's pretty much well known that he knows a lot about that kind of stuff. Um, he will sit there and tell me that this is so hard for me to overcome. He tells me that sometimes you can just get down on water and just hunt. Don't matter which way the wind's blowing, you can, uh, you know, you're going to end up maybe winning some deer or getting winded, and you're some of the deer are not going to wind you because they're going to come from different areas. Now, for a lot of us, just say, say, you know, we're hunting more Midwest stuff or Eastern stuff, and you've got these, these, this water that's in the woods. Um, it, it matters, and I think, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to go against what Tony says here because I think he 100% is right in some situations or probably a lot of the situations he hunts. But in some situations, I think that, like especially on private property, you have a buck that you want to shoot because he's on your private and that's the only buck that you've seen on camera. You don't want to just sit there and let your wind swirl around. Like, you want to be pretty sure what you're Mm -hmm. doing there. And this is where a camera comes in. Now, there's there's a a deal here where it's like, you can go down there and kill a deer, mm-hmm. but if you can put the wind in your favor and still do it, why Even not? Yeah. yeah, yeah, and I'm sure Tony would agree with that. No, he he definitely would. Yeah, uh, but it, it, like I said, if it's a private deal, like he's talking about hunting public grounds mostly. Mm-hmm. So if it's a private deal, man, like you you want to make sure like you know where this deer is bedding from. So mm-hmm. I think that the main idea <clears throat> when you're hanging on water is that a lot of times deer are going to drink out of a fairly small water source. Mm-hmm. It's going to be a smaller uh, tank or pond or whatever. Um, you're going to want to figure out where, and you can see this, KC is really good at figuring this stuff out, but like you can see where a deer or most of the deer are coming up to this pond. You can like, there's always, especially like if we're talking early season, like we are right now, you can see when the, as that lake or pond starts to draw down, um, lots of tracks in the mud, the grass, you know, it's no longer, uh, 
grass growing on the edges of the pond because it's shrunken down into the dirt. Man, if you can find a place, <clears throat> like if you can hunt an area that doesn't have hogs too, this yeah. helps so much. Yeah, for sure. And, and so if you don't have hogs, it's it's really, really pretty easy to see where the majority of these deer are coming up and drinking. Knowing that, that's uh, probably the place you want to aim uh, your camera and you can see uh, you know, you, you want to make sure that you can get in frame which direction these deer are coming from or mm-hmm. what you assume is the direction. Therefore, if it's not, you can make other predictions. But uh, that way you know what direction they're coming from and you know what, what uh, wind to hunt it on. Mm-hmm. And so you don't want to hunt it. This is something I think that you got to make sure, but you don't want to hunt. I don't think you want to hunt. I don't know. Maybe on a water source it's different because they need water um, sometimes, but... I don't think you want to hunt it on a directly 180 degree wind um, from the direction they come from. Think about you this. I mean? Yes, I'm with you for sure, and I'm going to affirm that for you. The The buck we're referring to that I killed, it's actually a film that hasn't been released yet. I'm super stoked to put it out. If you came to the event that we did at uh, Cabela's in Austin here a while back, the Dawn X, like you got to see the footage of that thing. Mm-hmm. It was pretty sick. Um, that deer did a j-hook to come to that water he sure did Uh uh-huh that's right he he i thought he was gonna walk past us and i was crying and then he like kind of like almost decided he had gone far enough and then came over to Mm -hmm. where we were to j-hook into the water source Mm -hmm. because when he came out i thought i was gonna have to shoot him at 50 yards and i didn't really want to have to do that down that other trail (laughs) yes exactly but no that didn't happen y'all y'all will just have to watch the footage um uh the vector arrow flew very very true as they always do in that thing you know what what what's the straightest thing from point a to point b a straight line it's a vector (laughs) you know what (laughs) at 12 yards or whatever 14 yards they're pretty straight pretty straight man (laughs) it's a pretty flat trajectory i love shooting 12 yard shots yes (laughs) and when it sounds like one goes through a watermelon you can hear the whole sound it's real cool um so this is a place where we hung that camera over that pila and that deer did exactly that he we had got a picture of a a shooter buck on that i don't think it was him i think it ended up being a different deer i'm not it's hard to say Mm. um but it worked out okay, so I'm mm. fine with it. Uh, yeah. yep. <laughs> um, but uh, anyways, that deer came out probably at like from where I'm sitting in my in my saddle. That deer is probably like at a seven o'clock where he like he first came into view. Mm-hmm. He then walked around the clock face all the way up to like. <laughs> almost high noon dude what <clears throat> i just remember because we had to set up 10 yards from each other yeah the great thing weird the great thing about saddles is you can get into some tiny trees the hardest thing about uh filming your buddy in a tiny tree is that you can't sit in the tiny tree with him so the weebles wobble and they wiggle <laughs> yeah. real bad so yeah and that's <clears throat> that's another reason we got in different trees is so we could wiggle our own trees and <laughs> you know we knew who actually messed it up yeah uh but i just remember we had a little buck um, that almost got an arrow uh, that showed up before this buck. <laughs> went, I was sitting there debating. I was like, I don't want to have to shoot this small deer, but I really want to shoot something. Yeah. And we're, then we're sitting there looking, and he, he turns and looks, mm-hmm. and I like, I'm like, oh yeah. And so I look over at KC, and uh, he looks right back at me, and we like made the eye contact thing, <laughs> like, yeah, there's another one coming here. We can see, and so then we, I can see KC start looking, and I see, I can see the buck before KC because I guess the trees are in his way or whatever. And so I'm like, I'm just waiting on him to see it. And when he sees it, he like turns his head real slow, like, you know, like trying not I to get was seen. Freaking out, and he's like. Gives me the big eyes, you know. It's like, oh yeah, I was so dang excited. I remember excited, looking dude. over and you just giving me a head nod whenever I yeah. finally can get my I eyes. Was like, to I got it, dude. I'm on this thing with the camera. That was the, and that's the thing that, like, if you don't film your hunts, or especially if you don't have a camera guy, then like, you don't ever really think too much about this. But like, there's this thing of like, I've seen the deer. Does the other person see the deer? <laughs> yep. And that's what I was confirming. And I look around, and your head's nodding. I'm like, oh, we got this, bro. The A team, the buck truck is about buck to lay truck. it down. Buck truck. <laughs> Buck truck. And it happened. Ugh. And that, like, there's never been another deer that a cell camera helped me kill more than that yeah. deer right there. It was absolutely crazy because you and I, neither are Tony Peterson. Therefore, we don't have 
<laughs> the confidence in the water that he does. Yeah. But I'm building that. And between Tony telling me information that works and the Moultrie mobile camera telling us that the deer were actually using that, we were mm-hmm. able to put that plan together and shoot a big buck. Dang and that's going to come out soon, right? I think like, like about a, a month, month from, from now. now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually, it might be a little longer than that. Maybe. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I don't know either. We got a, we got a calendar of videos, and <laughs> so uh, we don't really know the calendar, but it's, right. it's on a calendar. It's, so. it's coming soon, guys, so get <laughs> hype about that. Um, but right now, we're actually going to go to uh, the interview we did with Mark Olis, where he talks more about the setting stuff mm-hmm. on these cameras. Uh, so uh, Super that way, helpful. Yeah, it is, because uh, it's the one of the great benefits – of having a cell camera is being able to put it out there and not having to go back to get it. And there's a lot of mm. stuff to that as well as the the uh, way that the app can help you uh, navigate this world and, and, and find bucks to kill. So mm-hmm. uh, let's actually just let Mark talk about that. All right. So now on the phone, we've got Mark Olis from Moultrie Mobile. Mark, what's happening, dude? Hey, guys. I, thanks for having me on. It's, it's great to be back on with you guys. And, uh, you know, we're just rocking and rolling in summer here, and, you know, it's, of course, like you guys, nice and hot here in Alabama, and mm-hmm. uh, just got deer season on our minds. Yeah, man, <laughs> we do too. It's crazy, but, like, you know, it's so hot, man, this time of year, but, like, it, it really, there is, like, a change in the in the light, the way that the sun is, the angle of the sun, you mm-hmm. know, and you can just, if you've been around on the earth long enough, you kind of get this this feeling this time of year where you're like, oh, that sun is kind of looking like fall a little bit, you know. A little more yellow. Yeah, yeah. a little more angle That's to right. it. That's right. So, yeah. anyway. The, uh, it's it's really trail camera season for a lot of folks, mm-hmm. which yeah. is exciting, but it's also kind of like the worst of the seasons. Not because the trail cameras are the worst, but it's because hanging trail cameras like – Preseason is one of the toughest things there is. A little bit man. stressful. Gosh, stressful, <laughs> hot as all get out. Good way to pass out. About two years ago, Tyler and I were hanging cameras on public land. We nearly died. Mm-hmm. Like <laughs> got out there way too far back, didn't have enough water, and just you know sweating our tails That's off. Fun. And yeah, it's kind of rough, man. But uh, it is exciting to be able to start getting those pictures rolling in. You know? Oh, it, absolutely. And I, and I don't know how it is by you guys, but I've been out putting up some cameras here recently and. Man, the chiggers are terrible right now, mm-hmm. and I'm I'm sitting here scratching my legs while we talk. So yes, it's <laughs> it's a tough time of year, but it's necessary and exciting all at the same time. Yeah, it is, man. It's necessary because this is, I mean, from about now until most people's opening days, it's a uh, it's a good time to find a buck to hunt on opening day. You know, um, and and one thing that I really like to do also, or one way I can utilize the information is, you know, even on cameras that I don't necessarily pick up bucks in velvet or whatever right now in August and early September, even on cameras where I'm seeing mostly just does, you know, it's it's still something that you can hunt um, and use to your advantage. And so, for for instance, if you got a bunch of does, they're probably not going to move like a buck will when he strips velvet sometimes. Like, those bucks will change their summer range and stuff. So, like, a lot of times you have trouble getting on them early because, you know, even the the information that you find in the first week of September, you know, changes because those deer strip velvet and move somewhere for some reason. And so, um, you know, if you don't have an early opener, that can be tough. But knowing that you've got does in the area is a is a good thing for November, you know, because they're not going to move nearly as much and relocate in these different ranges like bucks are used to having to do. And so, you know, that's one thing I like about running cameras this time of year. It really can be, I mean, it doesn't matter if you get a target buck or not, you still can use this stuff to kill, kill good bucks, you know, at some point during the season. Uh, I agree. I agree with you wholeheartedly. And, you know, on our particular property here in East central Alabama, uh, th- that's typically what happens. We get our cameras up and, and, you know, we, we can run feeders here. So we'll go ahead and get those running. Cause that's a good way for us to kind of take inventory on what's mm-hmm. living on our place. So, so we do that, but you know, we, we're big into the food plots too. And, and we, we do the soil sample. So we've got really, really nice food plots and the deer absolutely hammer them. But you know, it, it's not until the early season isn't when we see a lot of our bucks on our property. It's it's actually, you know, once those acorns are done mm-hmm. and, and once you get some of that frost killing off the green vegetation, 
that's when we see the influx of bucks coming in because at that point our food plots are just they are the draw and and those bucks are coming in and and we've got the late rut here right so Mm -hmm. we're not a november rut so we've got all season that that our bucks are kind of in that pre-rut phase until january but what's bringing them in is the groceries you know and and because we've got those cameras out it, you know, those does are in that spot for a reason. Uh, they're not going to leave the food, cover, and water. So those bucks are going to be there, just like you said, later on if they're not there already. Yeah. You know, we, we've we been – so we've been using the Moultrie stuff, like we've told people, like for the last couple of years. And um, the the Moultrie Mobile Base, uh, you guys are, are introducing some new cameras that are have some really cool technology as well. They've, they've done well for us. And one thing that we like to do, you know, this time of year is uh, try to get some hogs. Hogs will get on a really good pattern this time of year. And you've got, you've got a consistent weather pattern with a southeast wind, you know, that's just hot every day. And so if you get, you get them coming daylight at the end of the day because it's cooling off a little bit and they're tired of sitting around, like that's a pattern you see every day. And so we, we, in particular use these things um especially the the cellular types of these cameras often especially even on hogs i mean because as much as a deer's nose is it is works to his advantage its advantage uh a hogs is even more so um you know they they can't see worth nothing so they are using that nose all the time you get in there start checking car game cards you know or sd cards on those trail cameras and you can push a group of hogs into nocturnal real quick basically so what we end up doing is using cell cams to our you know advantage basically and be able to monitor these hogs and go oh they're coming in every evening at 7 p.m let's go in there set up about 6 15 and uh you know sweat it out for just a little bit and wait on them to come in and it's it's just a fun way to hunt you know there's no uh, sometimes like people want to make hunting not worthy if it's not hard and sometimes i'm like you know what when i was when i was 10 i didn't hunt because it was hard i hunted because it was fun you know and i'm kind of in the same boat these days too so uh (laughs) but you know with the with the cell cameras we wanted to talk specifically about these things cut to the chase and get to talking about some of the best ways to maximize battery life because that's something that people have an issue with across the board with cell cameras sometimes uh ways to take advantage of uh of also sd card space or you know in some cases you may not even need an sd card we'll find out at some point and then also just uh you know some of the best ways to find these these bucks and uh you know basically organize all your your photos and stuff like that so that when you go in you look at barometric pressure or wind or weather patterns or whatever that you can uh you can find that stuff easily and really just like dial it in on some of these bucks. So with that said, I just want to kind of open it up to you, man. Give us some of the, the new features that are coming out uh, when some of these cameras talk about them a little bit and kind of tell us why this stuff uh, can help us, man. Yeah, uh, no, absolutely. I, I I hear you loud and clear. And yeah, you know, first I, I'll touch on the battery life thing because you know that that's the one thing we hear about the most, um, and, and it's like, man, these these, and, and you see it on social media, and it and it doesn't matter the brand. It's like, gosh, these cell cams eat through batteries, mm-hmm. you know, and mm-hmm. and it's like, yeah, they they absolutely can eat through batteries, and the the cool thing is with a cell cam, um, I mean, you hop on your phone, uh, you know, you, your camera may be the next state over, you know, it may be hours away, but you get on your phone and you can change those settings at the drop of a dime. So that's, what's cool. So you, you don't have to go back to that camera to mess with it, but inside the settings, you can save battery life tremendously. And, and there's, there's a few things that I always recommend to guys. And, and a lot of times is, um, you know, the, the folks that you see commenting on these cameras, eat batteries, you know, they're, they're typically newer to running cell cams. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's, there's a little bit of a learning curve in that aspect. And the first thing I'll tell guys, and, and, and it's it's the one thing everyone that gets a cell camera for the first time wants to do, you want to put that bad boy on immediate mode because you want to see when those, it's like, man, look, look what's at my tree. 